But what we basically have here is 72 Blackwell GPUs or 144 dies. This one chip here is 1.4 exaflops. This is Jensen Huang during the week at CES talking about the Grace Blackwell NVLink 72. And it's a very large combination of 72 uh, Blackwell GPUs. You can see them here. Uh, they're in four patches and a vast amount of memory, 576 memory chips, making up 14 terabytes of memory. So you could actually load a model that would be that large. I don't think anyone is training a model that large. Uh, the latest Llama model is 405 billion parameters. But this gives you a lot of flexibility for having very large batch sizes and for having very long context lengths and training them without having to worry too much about communication between chips. Now, if you break this down, this is 72 of the B200 GPUs, each of which is able to do 18 uh, tops. That's tera operations per second in 4-bit precision and has a memory each of 180 gigabytes and a bandwidth that's reading from the high bandwidth memory into the GPU at eight terabytes per second. And you'll notice if you compare it with the previous generation, which is the Hopper generation, uh, you can see some of the numbers here for comparison. There's a significant almost uh, five-fold increase in the tops. That's the operations per second. There's a bit of an increase in the memory per GPU, and there's almost a doubling of the bandwidth, which is the speed at which you're reading into the memory. Now, actually, much of the increase here in the tops is because of moving to being able to support four-bit operations um, instead of just 8-bit. But actually, a lot of the models today don't even run in 8-bit, at least the open source ones. They're mostly in 16-bit. Only the DeepSeq model that had been re has been released recently was trained in 8-bits. And I don't know of any models that have been trained in FP4. It's interesting, if you take a look at the data sheet actually for the B200, uh, and this is the DGX B200, so it actually has eight of these B200s in it. Now you can think of what Jensen was showing here as being nine times uh, this, because it's nine eighths to 72. Uh, but if we look at the spec sheet, there's a comment here about 72 petaflops FP8 training and FP4 inference. Uh, so this is almost suggesting that NV NVIDIA either sees in what is in the pipeline of companies like OpenAI that they're looking at FP8 training and then inference in FP4, or maybe it's aspirational and NVIDIA would like the industry to move this way and towards using these data formats that do allow for higher flops. Now, one of the interesting questions to ask is, how is NVIDIA's strategy going to evolve now that we see techniques like O1 and O3 from OpenAI seem to be working well? This means you need to spend a lot more compute during inference, and you probably will want to be running larger batch sizes, which means doing more inference in parallel for every one customer's query. Now, having larger batch sizes, particularly with longer context, means that you're going to have to have more storage available. So perhaps we're going to see an increase in the ratio of this amount of storage rise relative to the bandwidth, that's the speed of reading from that storage, and relative to the compute of the GPUs. Something else that we might think of moving forward is if we are doing these kind of search approaches where you forward pass using the language model and then maybe do a check using a CPU or some other verifier. Perhaps there are going to be more embeddings of CPUs within the process train of having GPUs. And maybe this will lead to having more CPUs or a little bit different layout. But remember, O3 is only very recently out and I'm not sure to what degree those plans would have been disclosed to NVIDIA or indeed to what degree it's clear exactly how you should architecture these GPUs going forward given the importance of inference and test time reasoning. Now, the next section I'll talk about is the launch of the RTX 50 series. That is the newer version of, say, the 4090 gaming GPUs you might be familiar with. But it's worth keeping in mind that gaming, at least how it's being booked in terms of revenue, is a small portion for uh, NVIDIA, although it's a big business. If you scroll down here to the fourth quarter 24 revenue, there was um, about $3 billion in revenue flat from the previous quarter. Whereas if you look at the data center revenue, that's up at $18.4 billion for the fourth quarter. So there's a factor of almost about seven between the data center revenue. And that has been the big reason why the market cap of NVIDIA has risen so much. But if you look at this um, summary here, and I'll put a link in the description to this nice video revealing everything in 12 minutes, the key launches, it actually focuses uh, on a very uh, relatively, puts much of the time towards a relatively small portion of the total revenue. Nonetheless, it remains uh, pretty interesting. So let's take a look. Our brand new GeForce RTX 50 series Blackwell architecture 
The GPU is just a beast. 92 billion transistors, 4,000 tops, four petaflops of AI, three times higher than the last generation ADA. And we need all of it to generate those pixels that I showed you. So the tops, that's again, the tera operations per second. And there's an improvement that's uh, about a factor of maybe three over the 4090 with the 5090. But again, much of that is probably coming from the fact that these newer 5090s are able to support 4-bit multiplication rather than 8-bit. So if you look at the ability to do 8-bit multiplications, the improvement is significantly smaller. 380 ray tracing teraflops so that we could, for the pixels that we have to compute, compute the most beautiful image you possibly can. And of course, 125 shader teraflops. There is actually a concurrent shader teraflops as well as an integer unit of equal performance. So two dual shaders, one is for floating point, one is for integer. G7 memory from Micron, 1.8 terabytes per second, twice the performance of our dollars. And here's the whole family, starting from 5070 all the way up to 5090. 5090, twice the performance of a 4090. So you can see here the new range of 50 series GPUs, and they're actually not too differently priced from the 4090s. I think the list price for a 4090, according to NVIDIA, is about 1,000. 499 right now, although if you buy it on Amazon, it's closer to 2000 because of the high demand and I think low production. So this gives you a sense of the improvement in AI because you're seeing basically the same price item uh, that has performance that is uh, significantly better. Certainly if you measure in terms of Jensen's tops, it's significantly better. If you measure it by the same yardstick, then there is some improvement. And ultimately in terms of the speed for inference, you'd have to test it out to see what that translates to from these boiler boilerplate spec sheets. Now we can take a quick look at the specs here of the 5090 versus the 4090. You can see the AI tops are about three times, a little bit less than three times the 4090. As I mentioned, that's uh, in large part because it's doing four bit instead of eight bit as I understand at least. Uh, the memory bandwidth is also significantly larger. So 1.7 uh, compared to one gigabyte per second. And when you're doing inference on a local device, if indeed you're using this for inference and not just for graphics purposes, one of the, the limiting factor is typically your bandwidth. It's this number here. And that's because you're running inference usually with only one sequence. You're not running a large batch size. So the limitation on your computing is how fast you can read in the weights. So ultimately the flops are less important often in a home device. And therefore, because the bandwidth is significantly higher, this probably um, is a better indicator of the performance improvement that you will get by moving from a 4090 to a 5090. Now, I don't talk a lot about graphics cards on this channel, but I did learn something quite interesting about the RTX series. So in this, in this latest generation, they are incorporating transformers within the RTX, uh, within the software. And that transformer allows you to get better graphics performance. And here's how it does it. Rather than directly doing the mathematical calculations for every pixel in a high definition display, it will actually do the calculations for a lower resolution version and use transformer models to zoom that up to higher resolution. And that turns out to be more efficient mathematically using those transformers internally. Which is interesting because if you're playing a game like, like Dune or some other video game, that means what you are seeing on the screen is actually partly being designed uh, quite literally in a software sense by NVIDIA because they decide on the last mile of rendering that takes um, the graphics from that lower resolution up to the transformed resolution that you see in 4K or whatever high definition. NVIDIA's latest AI supercomputer. This is Project Digits. And it doesn't have a name as of yet, but it's a device that you can run at home and you'll be able to run a model as large as say Llama 70B on it, which is something that's quite difficult to do. Even if you have quite a high end Mac, you won't have enough VRAM typically. This is gonna be priced at $3,000. And because it's using Nvidia chips, it should give a very fast option uh, for home computing. Here's a quick look at a mock-up of the device. It's got four terabytes of hard drive. So a lot of space for model weight storage. It's got 128 gigabytes of VRAM. So you should be able to store uh, a model in 8-bit very easily. You should be able to fit a model in 8-bit rather fully onto that VRAM if it's even 70 billion parameters in size. And you can see that it operates at one petaflop of FP4 AI compute. 
Um, and all the caveats go here for NVIDIA's performance metrics. This is probably uh, sparse, not dense flops. And because it's FP4, it means if you do it on an FP8 or a 16-bit comparison, which is how we run most models, it actually would be something like a half, a quarter, or even an eighth of that one petaflop number. Nonetheless, this is quite a high rate of compute. And because it's optimized for doing parallel operations and AI operations, it will perform much better than even a Mac that has the similar level of nominal flops. Now, if you remember when I mentioned the 50 series of graphics or of GPUs for graphics rendering, I described how the limiting factor, if you're using them for inference, is the memory bandwidth. And so there's the open question of what the memory bandwidth is for this project digits. And it's unclear as of now. In fact, I see references online that suggest it could be 800 gigabytes per second, which would put it uh, into a similar ballpark as the RTX 4090, but it could be as low as 256 uh, gigabytes per second, which would be a quarter of that and would correspondingly probably reduce the inference speed or the tokens per second by a similar amount. There is this piece here that suggests there are six LPDDR5X. These are the high memory um, bandwidth modules. And based on this, assuming that they are uh, I think 64-bit buses, the computation gets to 825 gigabits per second. But then I see this Reddit post where looking at a graphic, um, the author does a measurement of the dimensions and calculating those dimensions suggests that, in fact, it's possibly actually only 32-bit uh, bus and it will have eight rather than six. But still, that would lead uh, to significantly lower number of bits and correspondingly a lower amount of gigabytes per second. If that is the case, that would mean it's going to be quite a bit slower than probably hoped in terms of inference. Uh, so we'll have to key, keep an eye out. Of course, this is just still in the design stage and it's yet to be seen exactly where this lands in terms of the bandwidth speed. And that's it for Trellis News for this week. Cheers.